1997, Bicon released a roundtable discussion video. This video featured a frank and open discussion among clinicians, sharing their real-world experiences with the Bicon system. Recently, more than 22 years later, we were pleasantly surprised to hear that clinicians around the world still refer to it today. So we present it to you now, digitized in high definition. A few things have changed since 1997. Our implants are now significantly shorter. We also offer more options for restorations, such as digital and indirect abutment level impressions, integrated abutment crowns, and trinia, a metal-free CAD CAM material. However, most things have remained the same. Bicon still offers unique design features and techniques that in turn provide for unmatched clinical capabilities. The Bicon design provides a locking taper implant to abutment connection, proven to be impervious to bacteria and without any micro movement. Fins and plateaus providing healing with cortical-like aversion bone with high mechanical properties and a sloping shoulder providing room for interdental papillae with healthy and aesthetic gingival tissues. Bicon shot implants provide excellent bone levels, often with bone gain. Our consistent surgical protocols with slow drilling and hand instrumentation allow a clinician to place a Bicon implant purchased today with an instrument kit that was purchased in 1985 and vice versa. I don't know of any other implant company that can say that. Bicon remains a simple, predictable, and profitable solution that can reduce chair time, minimize morbidity, and the need for grafting while increasing patient acceptance. We hope you enjoy this presentation. Let's hear from a group of clinicians who have had a great deal of experience with multiple implant systems, including the Bicon system. I think the biggest problem I had with implants in general was trying to get my restorative dentist to use the implants I was placing. Um, and, and I think they had a lot of problems with all the componentry with this tackle box full of, of screws and, and gadgets. Larry, you, you had experience with other systems, several other systems. Um, what was your impression? Before our office started using Bicon implants, when we referred the patient back, the general dentist would be saddled with a lot of uh, laboratory bills that I really didn't have much to do with, and all of a sudden, some of the dentists weren't doing implants anymore. There are a couple of areas where cost is a major factor. The, the first one is in the component cost and the chair time. <clears throat> and the um, screw type implants, the hex head implants, the lab fee can be about three times that of uh, a conventional crown, for instance. The costs of restoring a Bicon implant are probably a third of what the cost would be of uh, restoring a screw type implant and the maintenance issues are just not there. When you have a, a man that sends you a fair amount of patients in a year and he finds out that screws break, it's tough to keep that relationship. So I only use Bicon, as you know. Joe, you're a periodontist, and I know you've seen literally hundreds of these Bicon cases. Uh, from a periodontal point of view, could you tell us about your experience? Actually, they look wonderful. Uh, inevitably, the, the tissues around the implant look superior to the tissues around the natural teeth. Almost no maintenance is required. The tissue is pink and healthy and it's tight and it's, uh, it's actually appears some, somewhat miraculous to me. <laughs> yeah, it does. It's, it's, it's extraordinary yeah. how, how well they look. Jack, you're a, a general dentist and um, you've actually started putting some of your own implants in. A postcard appeared in my mail and that was my introduction to Bicon which was kind of what I was looking for. I, I wanted something that was going to bring me to conventional dentistry once the implant was placed. Seating the abutment in the implant is a very quick and easy procedure. From there on, it's general dentistry. Bob, you know, you've probably had more experience than anyone here because as one of the better lab technicians, you get to see everything. I spent hours on the phone with doctors with calls about just seating the transfer coping on the hex, taking an x-ray. And if they didn't get the cone on the x-ray right, then it would disguise the fact that the sides might be confluent, but the coping wasn't down. It was caught up on, that, uh, on the edges. You get a couple of those in a case, and then the whole thing is off. And 
it's disastrous. And then it's no wonder that the surgeons and periodontists didn't get any more business. They were, they were scared to death. And, and once they got out of it, they said, Phew, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> Something you know, that, that I think is very interesting, and that is you're talking about putting in a three unit bridge versus an implant. And that is the research that um, was just recently reported on the long term viability of abutment teeth <clears throat> in, at the 20 year period. Uh, abutment teeth that are prepared for bridges have about a 10% greater chance of being lost than if the teeth aren't prepared at all. So that putting in an implant gives the patient a better chance of maintaining those teeth on either side of the edentulous space. People are really impressed. They're not going to violate the teeth on either side. Yeah, That's a major sure. league kind of a thing. From the standpoint of putting in a single tooth implant, it's the reliability of the abutment that makes all the difference. And uh, when you have a screw-retained abutment, it's going to loosen. The locking taper doesn't loosen. We did an article on that, and the uh, percentage of loosening uh, over a four-year time frame in about 1,800 implants was 1.5 percent. Uh, there was about a point loosening, of, loosening the of the abutment, abutment. and a 0.5 uh, percent fracture. And again, this was in 1,800 implants. So you're looking at a 2 percent complication rate. When we talk about failure rate in the literature, that, that generally means loss of integration. Right. But as I say, and as Bob just alluded to, if you ask your patient what's a failed case, it's when the tooth is in their hand. And, and they always call and say, my implant fell out. Yes, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, my that's implant true. fell out. But that doesn't happen with the locking tape. We have learned that optimum treatment with implants, uh, with multiple implant cases, obviously can be very expensive. You have five, six, seven, eight implants and then go right to a nice metal porcelain bridge, you're talking about some serious money. And yet, we also feel that there are ways that you can lead into that. Have any of you had any experience uh, doing this with implants? In other words, perhaps starting with O-rings and then switching over to uh, something fixed or use a lab-cured provisional bridge for a year or two until they could afford converting over. Um, have you ever had that experience? Yeah, essentially that. Um, we had three implants, four implants in the lower anterior with a bar and clip and a, an overdenture. And then uh, the patient wanted to have a fixed prosthesis, and so we put in two more implants and a temporary acrylic bridge for a year or so, and then finally the uh, porcelain fused to metal bridge. You could retrofit a denture. You could go and make them new dentures next. Then, if they want to add uh, more implants and go to a fixed, so it's almost like an installment plan that can be started very inexpensively. Has anybody in the Retro table retro taken the heads out? The way a locking taper works is when it's tapped in position, it takes approximately 90 pounds of straight vertical force to remove it. However, if you twist and pull at the same time, then you can break that locking taper. It's the same as the chuck that goes on your dental lathe. You can't pull that off, but you can remove that chuck by spinning that little uh, cam counterclockwise. So you, you can retrieve a locking taper. Now, I just had a woman, a woman had a stroke. I put three ball, ball attachments in the lower anterior because the woman couldn't keep a denture and she's, she shakes a lot and things like that. And when I did it and reattached the tissue after I exposed them, the tissue shrunk down quite a bit and they stood too high. So the woman came to my office, she wasn't in the office six minutes. I mean, turned and pulled, put one back in, shot a dimension, tapped them in, and she was gone in no time. How did and you do it, Dave? What did you I, I have a, an ash forcep that's serrated, put it right on it, turn it and pull. It doesn't take 30 seconds to take them out. I've had no problem at all replacing and changing. Uh, you were talking about retrofitting. Has anyone tried just using some soft, uh, chair side soft liner over balls uh, for a real economy type of getting this patient some help for very little money? This, I had a gentleman in who had had his teeth out at the, at the end of World War II and uh, with the usual amount of ridge resorption being none left when he got to me and I uh, had been a patient for quite some time. We tried a number of relines and very easy going gentleman and, and very tolerant and he said, yeah, it's okay and one thing led to another. I picked up the Bicon system and I thought, let's see if he's interested and he was. I put in four and took his old denture, just bored out the inside and seated it in. Um, he liked it quite a bit. 
I have an 83-year-old woman who is, is quite ill. She's in a wheelchair. So being able to retrofit her partial denture to make it more stable when she lost a tooth has made her very comfortable. I have a lot of people come in and they say, well, I'm 75 or I'm 69 or I'm whatever age they are. If I was 40, I'd have an implant. I'm too old now. First of all, those are the people that the mortgage has been paid, uh, the kid's tuition has been paid. Uh, a lot of these people, their entire social life is going out to eat with their friends. This is the group of people that, quite frankly, can best afford it. An interesting thing you can do as a, as a specialist, you have this opportunity with, with the Bicon system in particular to deliver something back to the restorative dentist which is extraordinarily easy for him to restore, a gift in a sense. The first two implants I did, I restored myself just to get a sense of how easy is this. And it had been a very long time since I had taken any impressions. <laughs> and it was just as easy as was said. It was a matter of taking the impression, making the cast, trying in a coping, and away it went. There was a point about sinking the implant three or four millimeters below the, the crest of bone. And I found that the advantage of that is that if you put in the proper size abutment, you don't have as many times that you need to do soft tissue uh, alignment with a, a soft tissue graft on the buckle. That's true. Because if you use the proper size abutment, you, you get the contour you want. With some of the other abutment right. systems, it comes right. out, it's flat, and you have to do a connective tissue graft or, or something to that's bulk it out. And I, I found that as a big advantage yeah, in the point. system. Bigger head? Yeah, bigger you just use a bigger head and you get a nice buckle contour. Well, the, whole, the whole system lends itself to restoring a single tooth. The conical shape of the implant body is hidden in the bone rather than these canister shaped heads which end up giving you troubles. And there's nothing that you can put on a canister head that makes it look aesthetic. Joe, you've actually seen some histology of the actual sulcus or cuff, haven't you? Yes. We find that there's very little bone dieback around the Bicon implant as opposed to most of the ones that I had placed previously. Mm. Um, do you think that uh, bacterial endotoxins in that critical area has anything to do with that? There's been a study recently uh, where uh, a screw type implant was uh, uh, joined to its abutment head as well as uh, a Bicon implant with its head and they, both of these implants were submerged into uh, a bacterial soup of some kind. The theory may be that there is a greater possibility of micro leakage occurring uh, along the course of the, the screw and its abutment head as opposed to the locking taper where you have a metal to metal, almost a hermetic type seal that has some impact on the bone and may in fact turn out to be uh, the disposing factor that caused this, uh, what, what everyone has seen with screw type implants, the die back to the first thread. Uh, I've seen, uh, as all of us have seen, radiographs where that bone, once it's at the head of a Bicon implant, stays there. We're not seeing the kind of die back that typically occurs with a screw type implant. On the restorative side, uh, the, the friendliness of the abutment is also uh, as important <clears throat> because the abutment is preparable, uh, like a tooth is preparable. As a matter of fact, as a teacher, I would almost prefer the students to start off preparing a bike on abutment head than a tooth. It's a uh, process that requires very little uh, previous experience or a lot of skill in dealing with implants because it's so similar to preparing a natural tooth. One thing I would mention, though, and that is that before uh, a surgeon does decide, or a periodontist does decide to place implants, it would be a very good idea to uh, talk to the restorative dentist to assure that the implants are placed pretty appropriately, at least where the restorative dentist wants them. Uh, uh, and, it, and it's quite simple with the stent technique that you developed, the two stents, one with the grooves in the facial surface and the other the suck-down stent to be able to determine exactly where that implant should be. But it does require input from the restorative dentist to do the diagnostic wax up or setup mm -hmm. and then make the stents from there. And that communication starting between the two inevitably leads to further referrals. Has anyone done any congenitally missing laterals at all? And I think the angle abutment helps in yes. those cases yeah. because a lot of times where you have the centrals and the canines where they orthodontically haven't been uh, moved, you, again, you have limited space the further you go apically, and so you have to put the implants more palatally. In that case, the angled abutments really help. Making the osteotomy by hand is uh, very helpful because you have such digital touch 
that should you actually hit a root, you can feel it immediately and redirect it. Um, because exactly as you say, we often want to put the implant palately and then use the angled abutment to upright it into the dental arch. One of the uh, problems too, Norm, is that <clears throat> in some congenitally missing lateral cases, the space is too large. Uh, if they have other yeah. posterior teeth yeah, you're right. missing as well. And the, uh, y you have a space that's too big just for a lateral incisor. So you have to put in two teeth or restore two teeth, but there may not be sufficient room for two implants. So uh, putting in one implant and a cantilevering off of it, just like we would a cantilever a lateral off a canine, works very well. And you can do that because, again, the reliability of that logging taper. So from a restorative standpoint, uh, replacing these missing lateral incisors uh, can be accomplished in a couple of ways. I've done some congenitally missing premolars so that the restored tooth was actually closer to the size of a molar, and probably half a dozen of those. Um, it's, uh, once the abutment is placed, it, again, it's conventional dentistry. And uh, the first case I did solo it was an 18-year-old patient. And um, there really was no complications. For the first implant, it was very humdrum. It went very comfortably. I, I wasn't stressed with it. The patient wasn't stressed with it. And uh, it was very successful, very easy to do. Claude and, and, and John, have you experienced that the increasing implant uh, practice is taking up some of the slack in the diminution of our orthognathics that has been brought on by managed health care. I think nowadays in the oral and maxillofacial surgeons' offices, we're going to the hospital much less and less because of managed care. Um, patients come in who need orthognathic surgery or TMJ surgery, et cetera, and they are just not being approved. Um, for us, it's helped doing implants because it, it fills that that time void, that financial void for us. The number of orthognathic cases has substantially dropped in where the implant um, end of the practice is building. Um, I'm not terribly disappointed. I mean, who wants to <laughs> go with all the headache and the, you know, the reimbursement from doing an orthognathic case when you can do implants in your office? Uh, the beauty of this system is the locking taper, and I can just say in a nutshell that it works, plain and simple. Screw systems have been out a long time. If they worked, would all be using them. The Bicon locking taper system locks. The bone levels that, that we've achieved with the placement of Bicon implants are excellent. We don't see bone loss. When you tap it in, it stays in properly. Never had a problem. Never had breakage. Never had a crown come off. It works. When I meet with colleagues from around the country, they generally tell me that they are doing some implant dentistry, but they'd really like to do more. They simply can't understand why the restorative dentist don't seem to be interested. I generally tell them, don't talk to the dentist and tell them what you can do for them. Find out what they want. Find out what your restorative dentist really thinks about implant systems. Find out why only 5% of the 112,000 general dentists have restored five or more cases. Find out what the lab costs are when they restore implant cases, as opposed to natural teeth. The answers to most of these questions is really quite simple. The restorative dentist has a hard time making money with implants. And it's not just the component costs, which we know can be quite high, but it's the great deal of extra chair time that it takes. It's the excessive laboratory bills, the redos, but mostly it's the maintenance problems caused by hex tops and loose screws. Think about this for a minute. Connecting a crown to an implant has to be one of the most basic acts of implant dentistry. Yet after 14 years, we still hear lectures and read articles about how to connect this and keep screws from loosening. Now, do we go to hear lectures about how to connect a scalpel blade to a handle? Of course not. The reason is that's simple and basic, and once we were shown how to do that, it required no further discussion. That's the way we ought to be able to talk about connecting a crown to an implant. Now, that's a difficult thing to do if we're using a hex top implant. The reason is that the physics of the configuration of a conventional hex top is flawed. And that's well stated in this book by an engineer named Alexander Blake. Remember, the hex top was never designed 
as an anti-rotational device. It was designed purely to turn an implant into bone. Let's look at what a well-known and very well-respected Independent Dental Research Association says about the Bicon implant. That conclusion tells the whole story. When I switched to the Stryker Fin implant, which is now the Bicon implant, I doubled my referral base the first year and doubled it again the second year. If you can give your dentist a secure abutment that they can treat like a natural tooth with no screws, no lab surcharges, and with the ability to restore a single crown any place in the mouth, you won't know what to do with all the patients that will be referred to you.